what's nice about this is if you change your mind or if you move, you can always uh, grow them or break them up or merge them, uh, whatever you need to do. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the ultimate utopia of bookshelving for a book, for a book nut. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, come back to you on that. <laughs> Stephen Pinker. I guess I'm uh, skeptical of existential risk as, a, as an important uh, topic for two reasons. One of them is that there's a long history, maybe going back to the book of Revelation, of apocalyptic thinking that always comes up in new guises. In every, whatever the newest technology is, people always imagine how it could be an existential risk. And the history of apocalyptic predictions is actually kind of amusing in retrospect. In the 1930s, there was fear that if you combine the poison gas from World War I with airplanes, then you could have the threat of airplanes spreading poison gas over the surface of the earth and extinguishing humanity, something we don't really worry about anymore, even though it's still technologically possible. And uh, when I grew up, there were both scientists and political scientists who said that it was a certainty that the U.S. and the USSR would fight a, uh, a nuclear war ending humanity, and that certainty didn't happen. And then there was polywater, a polymerized form of water that would turn all of the world's water into uh, thick goo. There's the, the, the nanobots that were going to consume every bit of or organic ma matter and smother us in gray goo. The problem with existential threats is they're very easy to imagine if you simply play them out in your, on the stage of your imagination. And they're often, I think, speak more to our anxieties than to, uh, to credible threats. I guess I'm more worried about sub-existential threats. That is, rather than worrying about the very last of the 7.2 billion people on Earth today, I think it'd be bad enough if there's you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or a million who get killed. And we know that there are things that can do that kind of damage. We don't have to play out far-fetched scenarios to imagine that people are going to be dying of hunger and disease and war and genocide. Uh, my priority uh, would be these sub-existential threats that are, that are certain, they're happening every day, and that uh, affect the fortunes of actual people. The issue tonight is to what extent are we still under the shadow of natural selection? We're not concentrating on grand theories, but how far does evolution make its way into everyday life? Evolution is about success in reproduction and survival, so let's start with human reproduction. To what extent are our sexual desires determined by our evolutionary inheritance? Steven Pinker. Well, I don't think people have sex for evolutionary reasons. They're not interested in propagating their genes. If they were, uh, there'd be no such thing as contraception. On the other hand, if you ask the question, why is there sexual desire to begin with? Why do people get pleasure out of sex? I think evolution has everything to do with it. The fact that people would rather have sex than, say, bump foreheads or rub an elbow against a knee surely is related to the fact that sex leads to uh, reproduction, whereas those other activities don't. Uh, more subtly, I think that there are a number of features of sexuality that can be explained on the assumption that it is a, a way of uh, sending genes into the next generation. The fact that uh, people are attracted to other people who look as if they're fertile, who have the right body shape and size and the right age. The fact that there so are... So is it men attracted to... Uh, from a book, men attracted to a particular sort of women and vice versa? And the difference between the sexes, the, in all societies, male sexuality and female sexuality are not equivalent. Roughly speaking, men uh, have more of a tendency to go for quantity, women for quality. And it's surely no coincidence that a man who has sex with 50 women can have 50 times as many children. A woman who has sex with 50 men is not going to have 50 times as many children. So that biological fact and that behavioral fact uh, presumably are related. And that's an example of how uh, evolutionary theory helps uh, explain some of the patterns of human sexual desire. Well, I say liberal values should not hinge on the empirical assumption that sexes, races, uh, ethnic groups are biologically indistinguishable. In many cases, they surely are. In some cases, they may not be. I don't believe that men and women are psychologically indistinguishable in every respect. But I don't believe that any policy of how we ought to treat men and women or uh, blacks and whites should depend on um, on the empirical claim that they are or aren't identical. We certainly know that anything you want to measure in any human groups, the overlap is enormous, if not complete. And that gives a, a practical justification for treating individuals as individuals. Namely, you don't really buy very much if you uh, 
use as prior information what group they belong to. Uh, in, in the sense in, you mean, see that in other words, that even if it were to be true, no necessary evidence that it is, that men were better than women at math, you would still have such a huge uh, class of women who were superb at math, far better than I could ever be at math, that you could staff every department in the country uh, exclusively with women if you made that as a social decision. Uh, that's right, that if, if you were to try to um, short circuit the selection process by saying let's give a, a few extra points to this sex or that sex uh, because of the statistics, you would gain so little mm -hmm. that you, you, you'd be much better off looking at the individual. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in, in either direction, because you can make the same argument for staffing, say, English departments with, with, with women with, based with, on the, the greater measured verbal fluency mm -hmm. of, of uh, women. So there is the statistical argument, but there's also the moral argument that it's unfair to the individual. And so if you have a policy of fairness, uh, then it really is a policy of the rights of the individual because you don't want to make it vulnerable to an empirical claim that might be overturned tomorrow. I mean, for all we know, it could be that women on average are biologically better than men at verbal skills or men at spatial, better than women at spatial skills statistically. And you don't want to be in a position of saying, okay, let's go back to gender discrimination. It wasn't right. so bad after all, we right. were wrong. You want to say, well, we were right in treating individuals as individuals. And then as a a uh, scientific question you can ask what's the overlap of the distributions and what are the sources of whatever differences there may be, but you don't compromise this important principle of equality. When we think about the U.S. system of, gov of government and justice, the U.S. Uh, Constitution, Christianity provided a lot of the resources for that. So I think there are things to be critical of and for Christians to apologize for, but I think it's a mistake to suggest that Christianity is all this bad stuff and religion is always this bad stuff and we need secular humanism to save the day. I, I'm not sure how strong that case is in the case of the, uh, the Constitution, although you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the, the legal scholar, but uh, the, the framers of the Constitution were largely deists who had a very airy-fairy notion of, of God, if, if at all, and were inspired by the um, thinkers of the European Enlightenment, Enlightenment, many of whom were deists, atheists, or agnostics. Jesus is not mentioned in the, con the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the only mention that's at all, even in the leaning toward religion, is endowed by their creator. Uh, but uh, even that was just a way of, of uh, getting the notion of uh, equal rights on uh, paper. Um, I, I think it would be a stretch to call the to call liberal democracy a, uh, a product of, uh, of Christianity, either historically or intellectually. And there also, I mean, the Crusades wasn't the end of it. There was also, of course, the, the uh, Inquisition and the European Wars of Religion, where there was just tremendous bloodshed uh, over what was the, the best interpretation of Christianity. There were you know, the massacres and genocides and uh, burnings at the stake. And uh, so it was self-correcting in the sense that several hundred years later, uh, things, things have calmed down. You don't have Christians and, uh, pro I mean, uh, sorry, Protestants and Catholics killing each other, at least you know, now that the troubles in Ireland are, are down. And, but uh, uh, you know, I would say it's a little too benign uh, uh, an interpretation of the self-correcting nature that would take that many centuries and with the European wars of religion in between. Um, Jesus' teachings and wondering, do you see them as radical as it relates to altruism and peace? Do you see them well, as actual yeah. teachings? Or, I mean, because there's a way to read the Old Testament and then there's a way to read the Crusades. But like his teachings themselves, do you see them as radical in their... I mean, a lot of the teachings are, you've got to accept me. Uh, you know, I, I come to you with a sword uh, and uh, he that values his own father and son and brother and sister more than, than he values me is not worthy of me. There's a lot of stuff there that's really more... Um, you know, gather around me, accept me as, uh, as, as uh, uh, the, the Messiah. There isn't the message that whatever you do, make people as better, as, as well off as possible. Increase life, uh, happiness, health. It's, uh, a lot of it is accept me. And that, I think, historically was pernicious because if you have, there's two sets of values. They can overlap, uh, but they don't always overlap. And uh, acting so as to maximize human flourishing, life, health, happiness, accepting that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, they're not the same value. 
if they, if people want to uh, foster both, okay. Although then, what do you do with the people uh, like my people, like the Jews, who don't accept Jesus? Well, I mean, we know what the answer was. It wasn't so pretty. Uh, what do you do with the rest of the world that uh, is not going to accept uh, uh, Jesus? Are they condemned to eternal torture? Uh, do you write them off? Do you try to convert them all? Um, so the part of the New Testament that is, uh, accept me, Jesus, and my teachings, uh, I don't think is morally um, so um, uh, salubrious. Um, if Jesus were simply to say, uh, maximize freedom, health, happiness, and life, that would be one thing. But my understanding is that that's, that's not what he said. The uh, third influence is uh, one that came late to me in my own career. I think like a lot of scientists, like a lot of academics, I, I believed that what I was doing was, was worthwhile. It kept me off the streets, got, got me a paycheck. Uh, I published in journals and, and got all of the uh, usual uh, academic uh, rewards. But it was hearing Richard um, sincerely and uh, in a heartfelt manner uh, expressed the idea that there was something noble about the enterprise of science, that this was part of something that's larger than any of us, something that is uh, noble, that, it, that is moral. Uh, this is something that scientists are not willing to say. It just seems to many of them to be, um, I don't know, corny or, or um, it's not going to get you any grants. It's, not, it's a, kind of an embarrassing thing to say. But Richard said it in a way that was uh, heartfelt and sincere and uh, passionate. And it awakened in me, in me the idea that, uh, first of all, this is true, that the pursuit of insight, of explanation, of truth, the humility that comes from testing your ideas, from being prepared to be wrong, from letting the world tell you that you're wrong, from uh, submitting yourself to institutions that allow you to be uh, criticized since no idea belongs to a person, the ideas for the ages, all of the ideals of science as itself a uh, moral system, as a purification of the best that we could strive for, uh, I really uh, owe, to, owe to Richard for uh, being willing to articulate it in a way that most scientists, however much they believe in it, would not be willing to go on record as uh, saying it in so many words. Yeah, no, I th I'm, un unfortunately, we're not going to disagree here. So, unfortunately, <laughs> for the entertainment value of the, uh, the audience. I have a cartoon that I had in my, in my book, The Blank Slate, which I think captures this uh, from Ar Arlo and Janice, where Arlo is up one night pacing back and forth. Mm -hmm. And he comes, goes to his son, and his son's sitting in front of the TV munching popcorn. He says to his son, why are we here? The boy says, to spread our genes. <laughs> and Arlo sits and the boy looks up and says, you still here? <laughs> <laughs> I think Arlo's anguish is what, what you're putting your finger on. And, and I, I agree that there's no reason that just because the, un that the universe doesn't have a purpose or our species doesn't have a purpose. It doesn't mean that we as individuals don't have a purpose or can't find meaning. That there are, uh, ultimately, it's a, it does push you to a kind of humanism in looking for value and purpose and morality, not in some unfolding plan of the entire uh, planet and, and um, <clears throat> life on Earth, but in our own powers to realize and um, deliberate among ourselves as to what is valuable and meaningful. And one of them is indeed understanding, thanks to the gift of our cognitive faculties, our place in nature, quite literally where we came from, what was the process that brought us into being, and that I think there is... The a, actual process that brought the us into The actual being. process, right. yeah, to be, and, and to be, to be, um, to have an, our, our best and most accurate understanding of ourselves uh, there's an exhilaration in that, that our species is smart enough and, and noble enough to have tried to figure it out and to have succeeded as well as it has. And also, there, there are, to be sure, depressing uh, parts of this picture. It might be nice to, to live forever, to have a soul that uh, survives the death of the body and, and lives eternally. It, it is, I mean, death sucks. I mean, it is kind of depressing to think that it's all of my experiences due to the activity of an organ, which someday will cease to function. 
Uh, but there's also especially if you work for a newspaper, that's very <laughs> yeah, right. sooner than <laughs> yes, some sooner than others. Uh, but there's also a, a kind of uh, maturity in understanding that that is our our state, that we're not fooling ourselves with childish stories, and that within the constraints that we have every reason to believe are there, living the most meaningful life we can, including the realization that there are things that are are beyond us. I mean, you, you talk about. Uh, deep time, but in a way that's, I think, emblematic of an entire um, mm -hmm. world that is larger than any of us. Time extended unimaginably before us and will after us, but also there are worlds of numbers and logic. Uh, there are space itself. Space yeah. itself, the physical process that uh, allowed the universe to unfold from the Big Bang, the laws of social organization and morality that might be consequences of uh, realizing that other people have minds as we do. It's certainly not that you could, you're only sitting in front of a TV munching popcorn if you don't believe that there is a transcendent purpose to the unfolding of life. We can figure out an awful lot of stuff, and an awful lot of it is bigger than any of us 